This video is dedicated to the great Baconian Alfred Dodd, a pioneering spirit in the deep minds of truth. I am here today to present for the first time the groundbreaking historical revelation regarding the secret of the first play written by Francis Bacon when he was only seven years old, in the name of his literary mask, Ulpian Fulwell, and its remarkable and extensive links to his later Shakespeare plays. In his refutation of philosophies, the great philosopher, poet and dramatist Francis Bacon said, Every man of superior understanding in contact with inferiors wears a mask, and goes on to say, From the moment you learn to speak, you are under the necessity of drinking in and assimilating what perhaps I may be allowed to call a hotchpotch of errors. Nor do these errors derive their strength only from popular usage. They are sanctioned by the institutions of academies, colleges, orders, and even states themselves. In the 1560s, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon was presiding over a long-running and complicated lawsuit brought by Thomas Fulwell and his widow Christabel Fulwell relating to lands leased from the Cathedral of Wells. We learn from a bill in the Court of Chancery addressed by Christabel Fulwell on the 13th of October 1564 to Sir Nicholas Bacon that the dispute between the powerful Dean of Wells and the Fulwells was settled in their favour. However, the lawsuits and protracted legal wrangles arising from the dispute continued for decades and resulted in their son, Ulpian Fulwell, never gaining custody of the land, which his father rented from John Goodman, the Dean of Wells, which still, decades later, remained a matter of litigation for his own children. With the Fulwell family complex legal disputes being dealt with by Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, following the death of his father sometime in 1563, Ulpian Fulwell studied to be a clergyman and was ordained on the 15th of September 1566. Around 1567-8, to Fulwell became engaged to Marie Stubbard, but the marriage was abandoned after he discovered she was already married to William Gascoigne, who through the marriage of Elizabeth Bacon Breton, her beloved cousin Lord Keeper Nicholas Bacon was the supervisor of her father's will, to George Gascoigne some seven years earlier, was a distant relative of a young Francis Bacon, with whom Fulwell already had some kind of secret and concealed relationship. It was around the time that the planned marriage to one of Bacon's relatives was abandoned. A play entitled Like Will to Like, Quoth the Devil to the Collier, was pr printed in the name of Ulpian Fulwell in 1568. An individual who had no known interest in theatre and drama and was not known to have written another play or any other form of dramatic entertainment in the remaining 18 years of his life. And nor, as we shall see, was he the author of Like Will to Like. The Greek philosopher Aristotle was reputed to have said, Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. This was certainly a dictum that applied to the young Francis Bacon, whose private secretary in his later years and first editor and English biographer, Dr Rawley, said of him, his first and childish years were not without some mark of eminency, at which time he was endued with that pregnancy and towardness of wit, as they were presages of that deep and universal apprehension which was manifest in him, in him afterward. Bacon's early prodigious ability and genius, the fruits of which are still hidden from posterity, were also secretly known to Stuart historian and biographer David Lloyd. He had a large mind from his father and great abilities from his mother. His parts improved more than his years. His great fixed and methodical memory, his solid judgment, his quick fancy, his ready expression gave high assurance of that profound and universal knowledge and comprehension of things, which then rendered him the observation of great and wise men, and afterwards the wonder of all. At twelve, his industry was above the capacity and his mind above the reach of his contemporaries.
There have been many outstanding child prodigies in history. John Stuart Mill learned to read Greek at three. Mozart wrote his first composition at six. Montaigne could read and translate Ovid at seven. And Picasso made his first oil painting when he was nine. Closer to home, from the age of 11, Bacon's secret royal mother, Queen Elizabeth, produced letters, wrote poetry, and, able to speak five languages fluently, namely Greek, Latin, French, Italian, and Spanish, she translated several classical and modern works in both prose and verse. Certainly, the persons and influences that shape our lives and minds begins early, and Francis was raised and surrounded by writers, poets and dramatists from his early childhood right through into adulthood and beyond. His foster parents who raised him, Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon, were concealed poets, writers and translators who circulated in manuscript and printed anonymously various religious and political writings. His foster mother, Lady Anne Bacon, was one of the celebrated four Cook sisters. The eldest, Mildred Cook, married Sir William Cecil, afterwards Queen Elizabeth's principal secretary of state, who, with his brother-in-law, Sir Nicholas Bacon, was the grand architect of the Elizabethan Reformation. The Cook Bacon Cecil family had very close private social and political ties with shared London mansions within a stone's throw of each other on the Strand and also spent much time at each other's country estates in Hertfordshire. The other renowned and famed Cook sister Elizabeth first married courtier and diplomat Sir Thomas Hobie, the translator of Castiglione's Il Cortegiano into English as the courtier, the well-known source of a substantial number of Shakespeare plays. Love Labour's Lost, Parts 1 and 2 Henry IV, Henry V, Much Ado About Nothing, Hamlet and Measure for Measure. She afterwards married John, Lord Russell, eldest son and heir to Francis Russell, second Earl of Bedford, Bacon's godfather and political patron. Her second husband, John Lord Russell, appears as a character in the Henry IV plays as one of Falstaff's crew, with Lady Elizabeth Cook Hobie herself the model for the Dowager Countess of Roussillon in All's Well That Ends Well. First and only modern editor, Professor Philippi, writes of Lady Elizabeth Cook Hobie Russell that she expressed herself in a myriad of registers in multiple media, with her voice conveyed through unpublished letters, manuscript poems, monumental inscriptions and elegies, ceremonial performances and two masks or dramatic devices. The youngest of these four sisters, Catherine Cook Killigrew, fluent in Greek, Latin and Hebrew, was also known for her ability to write poetry, and all four Cook sisters contributed poems in Greek and Latin to a scientific manuscript treatise in Italian, entitled The Cultivated Cosmographical Garden, attributed to Bartolo Silva and dedicated to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, intended as a presentation copy for Queen Elizabeth. From his earliest years, Lady Bacon personally supervised Francis's early education, carefully selecting his tutors and placing great emphasis on his instruction in radical Protestant theology, with strong leanings towards Puritanism. Their earliest known tutor at Gorhambury was a chaplain named John Walsall, a graduate of Christ Church, Oxford. He acted as the tutor of Francis and Anthony Bacon from 1566 to at least 1569. He recalled Anthony and Francis as such children as for the true fear of God, zealous affection to his word, obedience to their parents, reverence to their superiors, humility to their inferiors, love to their instructors, I never knew any excel them. Francis also received from Lady Bacon a rigorous teaching in classical and modern languages and a serious training in classical texts. In particular, Francis was raised on the favourite authors of Sir Nicholas and Lady Bacon, namely Seneca and Cicero, that they used to read to each other as well as to Francis. 
In a poem written for his wife, Lady Anne, in a time of his great sickness, Sir Nicholas reveals how he took great comfort in her reading to him from her Tully, Cicero and My Seneca. In reading pleasant things to me, whereof profit we both did see, as witnesses can if they could speak, both your Tully, Cicero and My Seneca. The gallery walls at Gorhambury were adorned with Latin verses or sententiae, chiefly drawn from Seneca and Cicero, grouped together under 22 subjects or headings to prompt deep meditation and serve as a memory system, which a young Francis Bacon contemplated and looked upon throughout his formative years. Francis would put to good use the radical Protestant godly upbringing and classical education received at the hands of his mother Lady Bacon and her love of Cicero in the play Like Will to Like, coupled with his own prodigious intellect and wit which would over time flower into him becoming the greatest playwright the world had ever seen. The play, written by Bacon when he was only seven years old, was registered on the station's register circa September 1568. It was first printed towards the end of 1568 by the printer John Old, and to give it its full title as an interlude entitled Like Will to Like, quoth the devil to the collier, very godly and full of pleasant mirth, wherein is declared not only what punishment followeth those that will rather follow licentious living than to esteem and follow good counsel, and what great benefits and commodities they receive that apply them unto virtuous living and good exercises. The only one surviving copy of the 1568 edition of Like Will to Like is housed at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. We do not need to look very far for evidence of Francis Bacon's authorship of Like Will to Like. He marked its true provenance with an anagram on the very first page of its text. The prologue to Like Will to Like commences with the name of Lady Bacon's favourite author Cicero in its first six lines in its first paragraph, as follows. It will be observed that the first letters commencing the first six lines are C, S, W, F, B, A, which form an anagram. Due to the deliberate formatting, four letters F, B, A, C are separated by the indenting of the other two lines. If we rearrange the four letters, they alone spell out F, B, A, C, evidently a contraction of F. Bacon. Yet there is no need even for this contraction. The other two letters required to spell out F. Bacon, the O and N, are printed next to the F and A in the fourth and sixth lines, respectively. So here we have F. Bacon in full. Throughout his life, Bacon was profoundly interested in all forms of secret writings like anagrams, acrostics and ciphers, and in, in his advancement of learning, he set out the following series of cipher systems. The simple cipher is a cipher system in which a number is substituted for a letter in the 24 Elizabethan alphabet, as shown below. W and S are the two remaining letters in the first six lines of the prologue to Like Will to Like. The W and S numerically represent the equivalent of 21 and 18 in the simple cipher system. 21 plus 18 equals 39, F Bacon in simple cipher. The first line, not including Diamisitia, which is printed in different type, comprises 39 letters, again F Bacon in simple cipher and the last line, 33 letters, Bacon in simple cipher, which is the sixth line, 33 plus 6 equals 39, F. Bacon in simple cipher. The six-line paragraph contains 56 words, F. R. Bacon in simple cipher. The whole page itself comprises the header, the prologue, and 32 full lines of text, 1 plus 32 equals 33, Bacon in simple cipher. When this is added to the three letters in the signature, B11, and the three letters in the tail word, and, 33 plus 3 plus 3 equals 39, F. Bacon in simple cipher. 
In other words, the anagram that is found in the first six lines, F. Bacon, is continually reinforced by several supporting ciphers of Bacon and F. Bacon, which of course completely eliminates any possibility of chance or coincidence. Its instructive title page indicates that the 15 parts can be played by five actors. Five may easily play this interlude, the names of the players. Tom Tospot, Hankin Hangman, Tom Collier, Lucifer, Ralph Royster, Good Fame, Severity, Chance, Virtuous Life, God's Promise, Cuthbert Cutpurse, Philip Fleming, P.S. Pickpurse, Honour, and its central character, Nickel Newfangle, the Vice. The prologue sets out how like are attracted to like, the good to the virtuous and the evil to the vicious, and how in this play we will see in a mirror the advancement of virtue and the decay of vice. The lives of ruffians and roisters end badly on the end of a hangman's rope, whereas a virtuous life attracts honour and dignity and ultimately everlasting eternity. The prologue concludes with, in capital letters, Finis, and its first stage direction, comprising a total of 33 words, Bacon in simple cipher, as follows. Finis. Here entereth Nickel Newfangle, the vice, laughing, and hath a knave of clubs in his hand, which as soon as he speaketh, he offereth unto one of the men or boys standing by. Holding centre stage, the master of evil and vice announces to the audience that he goes by the name Nickel Newfangle and delivers a speech. Before he was even born, Newfangle the vice recalls he made a journey to hell, where he was bound before his nativity to Lucifer himself, who all kinds of science he taught unto me. The devil enters the stage and Newfangle addresses him as my godfather Lucifer, followed by a stage direction. This name Lucifer must be written on his back and on his breast, with Lucifer in turn addressing him as mine own boy. Lucifer tells Newfangle not to be afraid, but in response he reminds Lucifer that he cares not in his own mind who he kills and maims, including having violence inflicted upon himself. More, Lucifer tells him not to be afraid, followed by these three lines spelling out another anagram of F. Bacon. The C, the third letter in the alphabet, is represented by the three lines and is the first letter of the second word in the second line, come or reveal yourself. For no such thing hath happened as thou hast said, but come to me, my boy, and bless thee I will, and see that my precepts thou do fulfil. Lucifer reminds him, Thou knowest what sciences I have thee taught, which are able to bring the world to naught, and praises Newfangle for how well thou hast played thy part. With his instructions from Lucifer his godson, Nickel Newfangle the vice carries out his tasks by manipulating and deceiving with false promises three pairs of characters. Ralph Royster and Tom Tospot, Hanson Philip Fleming, and Cuthbert Cutpurse and Pierce Pickpurse. In a curious jest, Newfangle tells his two confederates, Tospot and Royster, that he will act as a judge in a mock court of law and pass judgment on which of them is the truest knave, in a passage which our dramatist pointedly plays or puns on the full name of Nicol Newfangle the Vice. First, Tom Tospot, plead thou thy cause and thy name, where learned you to stand capped before a judge? You soutily knave, show you all your manners at once. Why, Nicol, all we are content. And am I plain, Nicol, and yet it is my arbitrament to judge which of you is the various knave? I am Mester Nicol Newfangle, both gay and brave. For seeing you make me your judge, I trow, I will teach you both, you lerrypup, to know.
This whole passage is framed by Nickel Newfangle when he directs Tom Tosspot to state his name. In other words, the whole passage is meant to be about a name or the meaning of a name and who that name refers or alludes to. The name Nicole is used for a woman and a man. The name Nicole is a French feminine derivative of the masculine name Nicholas. This is the Christian name of Sir Nicholas Bacon, who is a judge and sits in a real court of law, passing judgment over knaves and criminals around the country. In fact, as Lord Keeper and de facto Lord Chancellor of England, he held the highest legal office in the kingdom, meaning he was the most senior judge in the land. Like Francis himself, his father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, was renowned for his wit, and it was said by their contemporaries, most notably in the case of Francis, by the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, that neither of them could pass by a jest. This jest by Francis, where the judge Nicol Newfangle was a cipher for the virtuous and upright judge, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, must have brought the Bacon family household to their knees in uncontrollable laughter and mirth on many occasions. The two tavern characters and drunkards, Hans and Philip Fleming, the kind of characters employed by Bacon in the Henry IV plays, are brought on stage for some tomfoolery and drunken mirth, and Nicol Newfangle the Vice has his fun with them. They exit and Cuthbert Cutpurse and Pierce Pickpurse make their appearance, who, as their names suggest, think it is a sport to pick the pockets of the unwary, taking a special delight in lifting the purses of unsuspecting women whom they are prone to speak of in very disrespectful terms. Nicol the Vice gives out to them false promises of lucrative plots of land, which will eventually prove their downfall and demise. The master of ceremonies, Nicol Newfangle the Vice, holds them all in the palms of his manipulative hands. Through the combined wickedness of the Vice and their own erring ways of evil and villainy, Royster and Tospot are reduced to beggary. Deceived and humiliated, Royster and Tospot turn on the Vice and repeatedly beat him with a staff and a bottle overpowering him down to the floor. The pathetic vice comically waves his wooden dagger around as he tries to defend himself and cries out for help as Royster and Tosspot make a run for it. The drunkards Hans and Philip Fleming, sick with gout, end their miserable days as diseased inmates of the Spittle House, the hospital for the poor, infested with lice in pain and misery. The final pair, Cuthbert Cutpurse and Pierce Pickpurse, depart the world swinging from the gallows. With the play drawing to a close, the devil Lucifer rewards the vice by taking him on his back through Spain off to hell. Virtuous life, honour and good fame then enter to praise their noble and gracious Queen Elizabeth. Honour asks God Almighty to preserve the Privy Council, of which Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon was a member, the Lord's Temporal and Spiritual and House of Commons. The play ends with virtuous life, honour and good fame triumphantly singing a song about God's vengeance over Satan, or, in other words, the triumph of good over evil. As we have seen, the central theme of the play, Like Will to Like, is the dichotomy of good and evil explored through its characters, or one might say the different colours of good and evil, the very title of the work by Bacon, which appeared in the first printed work with his name on the title page, the 1597 edition of his essays. From his early days until his last, the subject of good and evil profoundly engaged his intellect. Over the period of his lifetime, Bacon assembled a very large number of what he calls semblances or popularities of good and evil, with their regulations for deliberations, in his promise of formularies and elegancies, his private notebook, in which he jotted down thoughts and phrases, many of which he used in his acknowledged writings and his Shakespeare poems and plays. In the promise, there are around a hundred of this collection of colours of good and evil, presented without any explanation, indicating, indicating Bacon intended to publish a substantial treatise on the subject. 
The first published version, entitled Of the Colours of Good and Evil, a fragment, includes only ten from the hundred in the promise. As stated above, a truncated treatise was first printed as part of Bacon's first edition of his Essays with Religious Meditations, a collection of twelve essays on the subjects of theology and ethics, complementing his propositions on good and evil. It will be recalled that the very first word in his play, Like Will to Like, was the name of Lady Bacon's favourite writer Cicero, with its anagram F. Bacon incorporated into its first six lines. As again can be seen from its opening six-line verse. In the first of his propositions in The Colours of Good and Evil, the second word is also the name of Cicero. So Cicero went about to, to prove the sect of academics, which suspended all asseveration, for to be the best, for, saith he, ask a Stoic which philosophy is true, he will prefer his own. As Bacon was wont to quote Cicero on more than one occasion in his play, Like Will to Like, Cicero doth say, Honour is the guerdon for virtue due, and eternal salvation at the latter day, and... Tully also these words doth express, which words are very true, doubtless. Semper iniquus es, qui ought invidet ought for it. They are unrightful judges all, that are either envious or else partial. So too in the colours of good and evil. Because that which cometh unto us without our own virtue, yieldeth not that commendation and reputation, for actions of great felicity may draw wonder. But praiseless, as Cicero said to Caesar, here is enough to admire, but what is there to praise? In the seventh proposition of Colours of Good and Evil, that which is next to a good thing is good, that which is far off is evil. Bacon provides an apt, sophisticated epitome of his play, Like Will to Like. Such is the nature of things, that things contrary and distant in nature and quality are also severed and disjoined in place, and things like and consenting in quality are placed and, as it were, quartered together, for partly in regard of the nature to spread, multiply and infect in similitude, and partly in regard of the nature to break, expel and alter that which is disagreeable and contrary most things to either associate and draw near themselves the like or at least assimilate to themselves that which approacheth near them and do also drive away chase and exterminate their contraries In the eighth proposition of Colours of Good and Evil, the ill that a man brings on himself by his own fault is greater, that which is brought on from without is less. He invokes the spectre of the poets in tragedies and their passionate lamentations before proceeding to quote his favourite poet with Ovid, Virgil. The reason is because the sting and remorse of the mind accusing itself doubleth all adversity, Contrarywise, the considering and recording inwardly that a man is clear and free from fault and just imputation doth attemper outward calamities. For if the evil be in the sense and in the conscience both, there is a germination of it. But if evil be in the one and comfort in the other, it is a kind of compensation. So the poets in tragedies do make the most passionate lamentations and those that forerun final despair to be accusing, questioning and torturing of a man's self. When towards the end of his recorded life, Bacon revised and greatly enlarged the advancement for its Latin translation, De Augmentis Scientiarum, he reprinted the original fragment of The Colours of Good and Evil, printed in the first edition of his essays, to which he added a further two colours, even though this was still only a small fraction of the material found in his private promise of formularies and elegances. 
After the twelfth and final colour of good and evil, he makes an astonishing admission. I have by me, indeed, a great many more sophisms of the same kind, which I collected in my youth, but without their illustrations and answers, which I have not now the leisure to perfect and to set forth the naked colours without their illustrations, especially as those above given appear in full dress, does not seem suitable. Be it observed in the meantime that this matter, whatever may be thought of it, seems to me of no small value as that which participates of primary philosophy, of politics and of rhetoric, and so much for the popular signs or colours of apparent good and evil, both simple and comparative. He plainly states that some of his colours of good and evil he collected while he was young, thus about the same time as his first play, Like Will to Like, in which he explored the same themes or colours of good and evil, a theme that flooded his consciousness from childhood all the way through to his very last days. The concepts of good and evil, which, as he himself tells us, were formed in his childhood, were part of his intellectual and dramatic consciousness. As his complex mind developed, he acquired a cerebral state of awareness and realisation that these two fundamental pillars of the mind, good and evil, governed and regulated attitudes, reason and the psychological and emotional processes of human behaviour, themes that were permeated all through the fabric of his Shakespeare works. This not only affected the individuals themselves, but all those around them and those that they came into contact with, family, friends and their wider social circles seeping into all areas and aspects of their private and public lives. Equally true in the cases of ordinary people through all social classes and right up to and including popes, kings and queens, whose good and evil values, attitudes and decisions created and destroyed kingdoms and empires resulting in the cost of millions of lives and untold suffering. The polarity of good and evil shaped the past, the present and would shape the future too. This polarity forms the veins and arteries permeating his Shakespeare poems and plays, in which there are literally hundreds of references to good and evil, virtue and vice, villains, evildoers and wicked, destructive, male malevolent characters, held up to us before our eyes in his attempt to steer the world away from all forms of evil and its terrible consequences for mankind. In his Shakespearean tragedy, regarded as one of the greatest works of Shakespearean criticism of all time, Professor Bradley presents a study of the four great tragedies, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear and Macbeth, in which he brilliantly sets out their moral universe and their critical central theme of good and evil. Let us attempt then to restate the idea that the ultimate power in the tragic world is a moral order. Let us put aside the ideas of justice and merit and speak simply of good and evil. Let us understand by these words primarily moral good and evil, but also everything else in human beings which we take to be excellent or the reverse. Let us understand the statement that the ultimate power or order is moral to mean that it does not show itself indifferent to good and evil or equally favourable or unfavourable to both, but shows itself akin to good and alien from evil. And understanding the statement thus, let us ask what grounds it has in the tragic fact as presented by Shakespeare. In Shakespearean tragedy, the main source of the convulsion which produces suffering and death is never good. Good contributes to this convulsion only from its tragic implication with its opposite in one and the same character. The main source, on the contrary, is in every case evil and, what is more, though this seems to have been little noticed, it is in almost every case evil in the fullest sense not mere imperfection, but plain moral evil. And the inference is obvious. If it is chiefly evil that violently disturbs the order of the world, this order cannot be friendly to evil or indifferent between evil and good, 
any more than a body which is convulsed by poison is friendly to it or indifferent to the distinction between poison and food. In a more recent study, The Battle of Good and Evil in Shakespeare, Erin K. Miller focuses on the four plays of Titus Andronicus, The Merchant of Venice, Othello and Macbeth. There is no question that, in every tragedy, Shakespeare explores the extent to which evil brings down the downfall of a character. However, a study of his four plays demonstrates an evolution in his understanding of evil. Beginning with Titus Andronicus and ending with Macbeth, Shakespeare over time portrays his protagonists becoming more and more consciously aware of the inner battle between good and evil. The black canvas of good and evil expressed through Shakespeare's miscreants and the like was widened in Professor Charney's aptly titled Shakespeare's Villains. This book is about Shakespeare's villains and cal calumniators and tyrants too, as they are related to villains. The topic is closely connected with an understanding of evil in Shakespeare. These villains establish an elaborate network of evil, what constitutes the world of the play, in which the good characters must function. Evil is rampant in Shakespeare and the villains seem to be able to overpower the virtuous characters, at least for a time. Tarquin in The Rape of Lucretia and Aaron in Titus Andronicus are Shakespeare's first villains and it is noteworthy how strongly they set the pattern for future villains. Aaron is distinctly a laughing villain like the vice in the morality plays. Professor Charney goes on to present a roll call of Shakespeare villains. Richard III, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, Claudius in Hamlet, Macbeth, several characters in King Lear, which he says has an abundance of evildoers, Angelo and Lucio in Measure for Measure, Don John in Much Ado About Nothing, Iachimo in Cymbeline, Duke Fred Frederick in As You Like It, Leontius in The Winter's Tale, and the worst of all Shakespeare villains, Iago in Othello. The figure of the vice so vividly presented in Like, Will to Like hovers around all these villains and many more of the villains and characters in the Shakespeare plays. In Shakespeare and the Allegory of Evil, the history of a metaphor in relation to his major villains, Professor Spivak details the influence of the vice figure primarily through four Shakespeare villains. Aaron the Moor in Titus Andronicus, Richard in Richard III, Don John in Much Ado About Nothing, and Iago in Othello. These wicked characters delight in mischief for its own sake and have their lineal antecedents in the tradition of the morality play and are evil personified. Professor Spivak shows that these evil characters trace direct, directly back to the vice figure in the morality play. With the purpose of moral instruction, the mor morality play dramatised the battle between good and evil, or vice and virtue, for possession and control of the human soul. In the Shakespearean universe of the tragedies, evil severs the holy cords of love and loyalty, cancels and tears to pieces the great bond that holds the universe in order. The same evil which struts its stuff in the form of Lucifer and Newfangle the Vice in Like Will to Like and its cast of villains which is wonderfully described by Professor Spivak in his summary of the play. Arguably the most vice-like character in the Shakespeare canon is the evil dastardly Richard III with all his constant chameleon shifts and deceits and seemingly unending plotting and scheming in bringing the downfall and murder of those around him. His vice-like characteristics, attitudes and qualities have not gone unnoticed by editors of the play. The striking similarities between Newfangle the Vice in Like Will to Like and Richard the vice-like figure in Richard III are quite remarkable. At the beginning of Like Will to Like, Newfangle the Vice enters the stage alone and describes, describes himself, telling the audience of how he was first born and how he made his journey into hell, where he was bound apprentice to Lucifer the Devil, who on joining him sets about plotting the downfall and death of others in the play. 
This is precisely the opening of Richard III, where in vice-like mode Richard introduces the play by outlining his evil plans for the death and destruction of those all around him. And later in the play, he proudly declares, thus like the formal vice in equity, I moralise two meanings in one word. The play, like Will to Like and Richard III, share a common heritage and provenance. The characteristics, attitudes and traits of the vice in Like Will to Like are present in Richard III, and much of the stagecraft of both dramatic characters are on display in both dramas, the one only merely a more complex and sophisticated version of the other. In addition to the influence of the vice figure on numerous Shakespeare villains, with his characteristics of moral depravity and high farce, the vice is also a comic figure who tries to seduce the mind and soul of the protagonist into dissolute and evil ways. In the Oxford edition of the first part of Henry IV, its editor, Professor Bevington, under the heading of Falstaff and the Vice, describes the influence of the vice figure who makes lewd jokes and obscene banter, engages in physical and sexual horseplay, and possesses the morality of the cesspit on Falstaff, and the influence of like will to like on the other drunken members of his motley crew. Prince Hal, in his forceful castigation of Falstaff, explicitly invokes the morality play and the vice figure to describe his character and his physical appearance. Thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humours, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that reverend vice, that grey iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years? Where in cunning but in craft? Where in crafty but in villainy? Where in villainous but in all things? Where in worthy but in nothing? It will be observed that in the passage Falstaff is likened to the devil, likened to the vice, just as like attracts like in like will to like. In fact, explains Professor Bevington in his Oxford edition of the first part of Henry IV, it is not only the characterisation and the dynamics between the characters that hark back to the old morality play in Like Will to Like, but it also shares some structural similarities that underpin and express the choice between good and evil. Falstaff's drunkenness and that of Bardolph is similarly anticipated in The Topping of Hands in Wealth and Health and Tom Tospot in Like Will to Like. Shakespeare's language recalls this tradition when the newly crowned Henry V refers to Falstaff as the tutor and the feeder of my riots. Behind the figure of the vice lies the image of psychomachia or soul struggle in which mankind must choose between the seductive offerings of gluttony or good fellowship and the path of righteous living between vanity and government. Structurally, the morality play dramatises these alternatives through the metaphor of choosing. It presents its action in alternating scenes of seriousness and riot that give dramatic point to a series of analogies or correspondences between radically opposed alternatives. Perhaps the first part of Henry IV's greatest debt to the morality play is to be found in its alternations between the serious plot of Henry IV and Hotspur and the comic plot of Hal and Falstaff. Falstaff, not dead in fact, carries off the dead hotspur on his back, just as Satan carries off worldly man to hell, in enough is as good as a feast. Similar actions occur in The Longer Thou Livest and Like Will to Like. To see the scene as homiletic contest between good and evil does not sufficiently account for its symbolic richness, but the legacy of moral choice expressed concretely through the pairing and contrasting of characters is central to the first part of Henry IV's dramatic structure. In Like Will to Like, a key stage prop of Newfangle the Vice was the wooden dagger, a comic weapon brandished by the Vice in the scene where Ralph Royster and Tom Tospot eventually realise they have been duped by the Vice. 
Similarly, in Richard III, the vice-like figure of Richard is never seen without his sword, which almost appears of it is, as if it is a natural extension of his being, which he continually toys with comically and menacingly. The same device of swinging a wooden dagger by the vice in like will to like is similarly used by Falstaff in the first part of Henry IV in an argument with Prince Hal. In like will to like, the vice, after leading astray both Cuthbert Cutpurse and Pierce Pickpurse with lies, deceit and false promises, finally engineers their deaths at the end of a hangman's rope, which is alluded to in Henry V with its reference to the wooden dagger of the vice. Bardolph and Nim had ten times more valour than this roaring devil in the old play, that everyone may pare his nails with a wooden dagger, and they are both hanged, and so would this be if he durst steal anything adventurously. For the above passage, the Arden editor of Henry V, Professor Craik, provides the following note. This dagger, i.e. this fellow roaring like the devil, in one of the old-fashioned plays, but so cowardly that every clown can give him a tousing. Here, and in Twelfth Night, Shakespeare alludes to the pairing of the devil's claws by the vice, the chief tempter and chief comedian of the 16th century moral interludes, e.g. Ulpian Falwell's Like Will to Like, where he fights his companions, but not the devil, with his dagger. Another aspect of like will to like, which later finds an echo in one of the Jacobean Shakespeare plays, is the stage direction in the opening scene, when the vice is joined on stage by the devil, where he is branded, this name, Lucifer, must be written on his back and on his breast. Professor Craig points to its reverberation in Measure for Measure, where Angelo is speaking of swelling evil and full seeming, known characteristics of the devil and the vice. In Like Will to Like, Satan is compared by the vice to Tom Tumbler or else some dancing bear, and is so grotesque that he has to be labelled. This name Lucifer must be written on his back and on his breast. Shakespeare is perhaps referring to such a practice when he makes Angelo exclaim in Measure for Measure, Let's write good angel on the devil's horn, tis now the devil's crest. The most important connection of all the Shakespeare plays with Like Will to Like is Twelfth Night or What You Will. The links between Like Will for Like and Twelfth Night or What You Will are clear, numerous and manifest, and set in train a series of interlocking pointers and signs towards a great historical truth hidden from the world for more than 450 years. In the first of these interconnected passages, the vice-like figure of Sir Toby Belch in an exchange with Malvolio says, Aye, Biddy, come with me. What man, tis not for gravity, to play her at cheery pit with Satan. Hang him, foul collier. The above passage is furnished with the following notes in the Arden, Cambridge and New Bloomsbury Arden edition of Twelfth Night or What You Will, in which they explain the references and allusions to like will to like. Foul Collier, Dirty Coleman. Coleman were proverbially associated with the devil for their blackness and dishonest dealing, which is also the title of Ulpian Fulwell's play, Like Will to Like, Quoth the Devil to the Collier. It contains the lyric, Tom Collier of Croydon hath sold his coals and made his market today, and now he danceth with the devil for like will to like alway. In Act 4, Scene 2, Fest disguises himself as the good curate Sir Topast, sent to examine Malvolio's alleged madness and demonic possession. In disguise, Fest says, Fie, thou dishonest Satan, I call thee by the most modest terms, for I am one of those gentle ones that will use the devil himself with courtesy. Sayest thou that house is dark, to which Malvolia replies, as hell, Sir Topas. Sir Toby confides with Fest, telling him we would be well rid of his knavery, a char characteristic associated with the vice. Fest continues to taunt and torture him by asking whether Malvolio was mad or a counterfeit before delivering the following song. I 
am gone, sir, and anon, sir, I'll be with you again, in a trice, like to the old vice. You'll need to sustain who with dagger of lath, in his rage and his wrath, cries, aha, to the devil, like a mad lad, pare thy nails, dad, adieu, good man devil. The song explicitly refers to the old vice and his staple weapon, the wooden dagger, in the morality play. But not any old morality play, the one already very clearly signalled above, specifically the morality play, Like Will to Like. His recent modern editors, Stuart and Knight, confirm that some of Bacon's writing circulated under another's name. His second editor and Rosicrucian brother, Thomas Tennyson, afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury, says those who have a true skill in the writings of Bacon will be able to tell if he was the author of a piece, even though his name not be to it. The historian and biographer David Lloyd stated that at 12 his industry was above the capacity and his mind above the reach of his contemporaries. His private chaplain and secretary who lived with Bacon for the last 10 years of his life and was his first editor and English biographer stated that his first and childish years were not without some mark of eminency at which time he was endued with that pregnancy and towardness of wit as they were presages of that deep and universal apprehension which was manifest in him afterward. In De Augmentis Scientiarum, after the twelfth of his Colours of Good and Evil, of which there are around a hundred in his private notebook, the central theme of his morality play, Like Will to Like, Bacon reveals he started collecting them while he was young. And in the closing song of Twelfth Night, or What You Will, he reveals that when he was a young boy, he wrote the morality play, Like Will to Like. When that I was an, a little tiny boy, with hey-ho the wind and the rain, a foolish thing was but a toy, for the rain it raineth every day. But when I came to man's estate, with hey-ho the wind and the rain, gainst knaves and thieves men shut their gate, for the rain it raineth every day. But when I came, alas, to wive, with hey-ho the wind and the rain, by swaggering could I never thrive, for the rain it raineth every day. But when I came unto my beds, with hey-ho the wind and the rain, with tosspot still had drunken heads, for the rain it raineth every day. A great while ago the world begun, with hey-ho the wind and the rain, but that's all one, our play is done, and we will strive to please you every day. When I was a young boy, I wrote a foolish thing but a toy. In his Essays of Masks and Triumphs, Bacon begins, These things are but toys. About knaves and thieves, the characters in Like Will to Like, one of whom was the swaggering newfangle The Vice, a play which included Tosspots with drunken heads, Ralph Royster and Tom Tosspot, and others led astray by The Vice, where Like attracted Like in a play called Like Will to Like. <laughs> 